Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. To it, especially because of what's been happening lately with the U.S. 10-year yield. We're, we're bouncing up against that 3% now. But um, he, he, here's the case here, and it drives me nuts. All we've been hearing about is this is the best recovery we've ever been in. Uh, actually, the best economy uh, we've ever been in. This is what we're hearing. Um, but how can that actually be true if, number one, the Fed is still keeping, and this is their words, not mine, uh, uh, their accommodative monetary policy going and will be doing so for the foreseeable future. Um, that makes no sense to me. And then number two, and this is the biggest one. I don't even know if you heard about this. You probably did. But the Treasury Department yesterday announced that they are going to be expanding their uh, auctioning off of U.S. debt. In other words, make it more available for people to buy more debt. Uh, therefore, inflating the debt bubble bigger than it already is. Now, if we're really in uh, a booming economy right now, the best it's ever been, why do we have to sell more debt to fund where we are? Shouldn't we be self-sustaining? Why? Wh who's going to buy the debt? That's that's also a big question. But absolutely not. It makes no sense to me. I do believe, I do believe that the Fed will raise rates one more time this year. I'm debating whether it's going to be as soon as September. Um, the market's trying to price that in, but there are a few variables in here. So we'll see how that plays out. But look, the Fed is, you know, you're going to hear a lot of people say that the Fed is behind the curve. It's not that the Fed is behind the curve and, and rates should have been way more normal than they are right now. They understand the situation is so dire. Um, that again, the Treasury Department has to sell more bonds just to sustain where we are. This is something that you and me have spoken about before. The issue is very simple and it's very straightforward. It's the debt-based economic model that if it's not fixed, we are marching down, and not marching, we are speeding uh, down a railway uh, at, at the highest possible mock uh, that you could, and we're going to hit a wall and we're going to hit it hard. And it's going to be utterly devastating to people. But without fixing the debt-based economic model, in other words, and, and this is the truth in my, in my view, uh, we, we've, we're watching world central banks continue what they've been doing now for an entire decade, printing cash out of thin air, buying everything in sight, including debt. That's who's going to be buying the extra debt here that's going to be offered uh, by the Treasury Department. And it's no surprise. You think China is going to be buying it in this environment? <laughs> I don't think so. We know Russia's not going to do it. But, um, you know, something's got to give here. And I believe this, what I'm about to tell you. Um, some country out here, and I, I hope it's us, under this president, maybe if he's got some functioning brain cells left, will introduce a partially – commodity-backed, gold-backed currency. That's the only way to fix the system. Whoever does this first, whichever central bank or government, in my opinion, the way we are going now down this, un it's absolutely out of control. It is not sustainable. And the proof is in our face, again, with what the Treasury is doing here in the United States. If we do not deviate from this pathway, we're all in a lot of trouble now. Whoever does it first, whatever government, introduces a partially com uh, commodity-backed currency wins, period. That's the winner. Uh, and I mean, you know, I'm not talking about like a 50%. I'm even talking about a fractional a percent uh, backed. And why gold? Because gold is 
the most stable asset in the world. I don't care what anyone, you want to laugh at that, go do your own research. It is period, the end. Uh, that's why it would have to be gold uh, as opposed to uh, another commodity. But that's the way I see it. Whoever does this first wins. And if if no one does this, what will, what will end up happening here is the debt-based economic model will do what it's doing right now, consume everything in its path like a cancer uh, until, again, that speeding bullet of a train is going to smack up against that wall. I am hoping that there is somebody out here uh, that is smart enough to realize that we can't do this anymore. We're done. I think the credit card's maxed out. Uh, it's been maxed out a long time. We have a clear debt crisis here in our country. And how do we know that? Well, how did they fix the European debt crisis? Does anybody remember that with a show of hands? It's okay. Put your hand up. Uh, well, they added more debt to it. Now, that's what we're doing here in the United States right now with the, the Treasury's last action. We're trying to fix a debt crisis by adding more debt to it. It doesn't work. Uh, all it does is make the problems worse. So that's my solution here. Uh, I actually, you want to laugh? I sent a tweet to President Trump yesterday offering my services to him for free uh, so we can talk about how maybe how to fix this because I don't think anyone either wants to fix it because they realize what's coming down the pike here. And all this is is a simple wealth transfer from one group of people to another. The middle class is being decimated. Um, and it's just terrible. I want to talk about the gold currency, but I want to go back to um, the, the Treasury where they're expanding the issuing of bonds to, I guess, anyone that will buy them. I mean, <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of countries. Isn't that funny? I, yeah. I love the way you just said that. The, the, the tone of the voice just said it all. But go ahead. I mean, right now, I mean, we know that like Russia's they've been dumping a lot of treasuries. Uh, Japan dro uh, dumped some treasuries and many other countries, they're dumping treasuries. I mean, yes, they're out there saying that, you know, because the economy is doing well, that's why we're doing this. But we know that they they kind of lie about this stuff. It's like 1971 where, you know, there's gold speculators and that's why we, you know, have to come off the gold standard. They always switch it around to make it seem like it's better for us. And this sounds like that's what this is. But to me, what it seems like is since we have all this debt and they don't have enough people buying the treasuries, they need to push this to the edge here and just to keep the system running. And if they don't do this, the system completely collapses like now. So I think what they're doing is uh, making it so that, you know, anybody can purchase this just to keep the system going a little bit longer. I mean, I think that's all they have left. It is all they have left. The system has been on life support. For, look, and I've said it in these exact terms since the, the meltdown of last time, the, the patient is, has been on life support ever since. That, that, that was it. That was the end of the system. But they managed to keep it alive by world central banks propping everything up on the back of, of debt like we have never seen before in the history of the world. It can't stop. This is what people don't understand. The nature of the beast is very simple. It's debt based, which means if we do not borrow more and more cash in greater and greater amounts every single day, uh, the system collapses. It, it's dependent upon that. It's, it's, it's relentless. So this is why we run debts and deficits. It can't be fixed. People think the cash that they have in their pocket has real value. It does. It has no value at all. It's not even owned by them. It's owned by the issuing central bank plus interest that they print out of thin air. To keep the system going and they will find every single way imaginable possible to continue to borrow into existence, which means uh, whatever they got to do, start wars, uh, create stories, uh, for example, uh, I mean, even trade wars, whatever they got to do to find a reason to borrow cash into existence so we can bail people out like we're bailing out farmers here. Um, it's, you know, people just don't understand how the system works. If they understood it, if they even had... I mean, a partial understanding of how the system works, people would be running for the hills. They would they, they, they would be frightened to death. It's really the truth. And uh, I, I think I have a good handle on understanding it. And this scares the living hell out of me, let me tell you. Um, so, yeah, they're going to they're going to have to do this because there's no alternative to it. Um, and that I think 
in my opinion here, that that's an act of desperation that they now have to issue more debt here to borrow more cash to get people to just write off more. Uh, these are all just IOUs. And, you know, uh, that to be paid at X future date, it's, cra it's crazy, but that's what we're running off of. It's not a wealth-based system. It's completely debt-based. And that's why I was saying that we need to, we, the only way to fix it, and, you know, and it might be too late either for that. In fact, it probably, I'm sure it is too late, would be to go to um, a wealth-based system, which is a commodity-backed system. It, this is too much what we hear, what we have here. And we've seen this before throughout history. Um, whenever these kind of debt-based systems have been adopted, yeah, there's X amount of years of prosperity, and then you hit that wall. There's no different It's but than, than what we've seen in the past. However, it's never been on a global scale like we have now. This is out of control. And um, when I have been explaining to people that this situation here is a greater threat than a nuclear exchange, I mean that. Because when the debt bubble pops, when we can no longer do this, when the credit card actually is maxed out and we, we just can't borrow anymore, well, what does that mean? Everything comes to a standstill and fast. Um, the first thing that's going to happen when we saw this already, we're going to get a credit freeze just like last time. No transactions, uh, no businesses will not be able to function. Uh, cash will not be able to be taken out of banks, uh, ATMs. That's it. Period. The end. Over. Um, that is what actually happened last time in 2008. And the only reason why the Fed was able to free it all up is for, through massive capital injections. Now, how do they fix it this time? Well, because the cap, the cash will be no good at that point. The cash is a unit of debt. That's all this is. So when this whole thing comes to a head here and it's time to pay the piper, when the, the when those, when that bill comes due, that's it. People don't really, people think. That the cash that they have is going to be able to go out and buy them a loaf of bread or buy them a gallon of gasoline or a baby formula. But I'm sorry to tell you, it will not be able to do that. On top of that, none of it will be there. The stores will be cleaned out so fast. At the moment we re reach a critical mass, there will be nothing to be had. Uh, and I cannot see a way right now out of a worst case scenario because every single day, which is what I just outlined, because every single day it just gets worse. We have distortions across the spectrum of asset classes unlike has ever been seen before. This it makes what happened in 2008 literally look like uh, you know eating candy in a candy store. Um, and that's the potential for this whole thing to correct to fair value because that's what's going to happen. Look, people who don't understand these markets don't realize that these markets run in cycles. They run in boom and bust cycles. And these boom and bust cycles are, for the most part, engineered by world central banks. What people also don't realize is more cash is made by the financial institutions, including the banks, during market crashes than during the boom cycles. Uh, it's, it's very simple to understand concepts. Once once, uh, you know, the, the, the stock market has reached its peak. Well, what happens? They pull the plug. This stuff starts to sell off. The banks start betting against their customers account. We saw this last time. I mean, a few of them got fined, Goldman Sachs being one. Um, and then all that, that wealth that was built up or the paper wealth in the market, because it's not realized, obviously, simply gets transferred to a bunch of other people. And I myself will be on that side. I will be shorting this market at that point. I will be the one, and this is why I'm trying to warn people, because I'm going to be the guy on the other side of that trade. When this market comes down, do you think, does anyone believe that I'm going to be sitting here? And it's not just me. It's all the institutional traders. It's every it's institutions themselves. It's people who understand the markets that are going to be sitting here on the opposite side, gladly taking every dime you want to give me. That's the truth. So you have a guy here, me, who's, who is a trader of these markets. That's all I do. And I'm explaining to people how this is going to play out and how guys like me are going to foam at the mouth when this whole thing rolls over. Because what we're going to do at that point is realize the cash that's going to be leaving these markets is going to leave the debt market. It's going to leave the stock market. It's going to go into our accounts. Then we're going to take that cash and put it into hard assets or suppress things. And we're going to capitalize on it a second time. 
This is what's going to happen. And you're hearing it right from the horse's mouth because I'm one of those guys that's going to do it. So please wake up, people. That you want to make me richer than I already am, well, then thank you, and I appreciate that. However, do you really want to do that? Do you really want to make guys like me richer than we already are? Uh, well, like I said, if you care about us all that much, well, then I appreciate it. But don't do it. Understand where this is going, and it's abysmal where this is going right now. The fact that we continue to borrow, no one wants to put a stop to this. It just gets worse and worse, and there's no stopping it. That's what it is. We're very close to that critical mass, in my opinion. Uh, and the proof is what the Treasury just announced that they're going to do, and the fact that world central banks, including ours, can't raise rates despite the fact that we have a quote unquote very strong economy. I mean, you said a lot there. <laughs> I know. I, I know I ran off at the mouth here, and I, I have a tendency to do that, and I'm sorry. No, but don't be sorry. But people need to understand how this, the potential here to unfold and how it will unfold because it's engineered that way. It's a simple cycle that it gets taken advantage of. Uh, and, and, and again, there's so much other stuff going on that you are well aware of. The deliberate suppression of precious metals here, how the richest people in the world are hoarding this stuff. This is no secret. Governments are hoarding it. Banks. Oh, banks hold it for tradition. You remember that one from Ben Bernanke? Are you yeah. kidding? For, oh, the, oh, it's tradition. So we hold it. They know exactly why they're holding it and they're holding more of it. So when you got guys out here like like uh, Warren Buffett telling you you shouldn't be holding gold. Well, guess what? I guarantee you that guy has four or five tractor trails full of it. Uh, so you just got to you got to look at the source uh, where it's coming from to understand what you need to be doing the polar opposite of. So I want to go back to um, what you were saying about the gold, putting the currency on some type of gold standard. But before we get to that, the system that you're describing now where the you know the market goes up and goes down, I mean, isn't this economy right now, this is not the economy that our founding fathers wanted. Isn't this a central bank economy? I mean, don't, don't we have to get out of this central bank economy? Because if we stay in this type of central bank economy where they loan money to the government with interest attached, I mean, this will never end. I mean, if, even if we wipe out all the debt and everything like that and the central bank still exists, aren't we going to end up in the same exact place? Sadly, yes. And you're right, again, our founding fathers, who were a lot smarter than anybody probably who exists on this earth today, um, they did not want this kind of a system that we have now. They wanted and they, they understood the importance of having a commodity backed currency. Number one, I mean, that was the first perversion of this whole thing. When we allowed this to happen, when we allowed central banks to dictate uh, the value of money or actually their, create their product. That's what their product is. It's debt, period. That's how they function now. Central banks would oppose any kind of a commodity-backed currency like it was their last breath. They, they'll fight against it tooth and nail because, again, their power exists in their ability to continue to issue debt. If, in fact, we even partially, fractionally backed the currency with gold, they would lose some of their power, even as a fraction of it, and they don't want to lose it. They, we have fought wars to establish a petrodollar uh, and a fiat monetary system. That's what this whole entire Vietnam War was about. People don't believe your damn history books. They're lying to you. The truth is we fought it to establish the petrodollar. Um, but, but you're right. And you hit the nail squarely on the head. Um, they, that's how they keep their power is by being able to continually issue debt. So. Here's the situation, unfortunately, how this is going to unfold here, because we all understand and we're seeing it right before our eyes with the debt bubble inflating. It's gone in a hockey stick. Whenever you see these hockey stick things, you know where you're in a bubble. Um, and, and we're seeing that now with regard to the debt. So the debt bubble is going to pop. Um, and we know this no matter because we've seen it throughout history with other assets as well. What attempt is they will make every attempt imaginable to keep the bubble going, but it, they rise above a level that can be sustained by any means. So this last desperate attempt here 
by the Treasury to issue more debt is just that, a desperate attempt to keep the bubble inflated. The bubble will blow. It will blow. And when the debt bubble pops again, it goes back to what I was saying before. The currency evaporates in value. If we, you, that, that, you know, you can't just go out here and say, well, you know what, we're just going to erase the debt. Well, the dollars are units of debt. So people think that if they say, okay, we're going to erase the debt today, we're going to hit the, you know, delete the control delete button or whatever you want to do, and there's no more debt. Well, guess what? That dollar in your pocket, it just went away. So what do you do now? So under, that's how they have us all. And understand that. They think that, or the euro, or the whatever fiat currency is going to hold its value in the face of some kind of a debt forgiveness happening. Sorry, everyone. You just don't understand how the system works. So sadly, whatever system comes down the pike, and I am sure that they have already have a backup system because we saw this already with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, they're going to issue another type of a currency that will be to their benefit, not to ours. Unfortunately, we are stuck in this here. And, and it's not going to change in our lifetime. I don't care who's sitting in that pretty White House up there. That's just the nature of how it works. And it's very sad to say. Now, with the Fed, I mean, we know what they're doing. We, we know that they create these bubbles. What's very odd, and, you know, a lot of people talk about the yield curve and, and you know, if it gets inverted, we're headed towards a recession. The Fed made an announcement that they're changing the calculation on how they calculate the yield curve. And they're also kind of hiding the Fred graph of their balance sheet. I mean, why are they hiding data from us or changing data? Why would they do that now? <laughs> well, because, like, first of all, I think most people, uh, except for your listeners, who I'm sure are a lot more on the ball than most people, um, who, who most people who walk the streets here, you know this as well as I do. It's very sad. They can't walk and chew gum at the same time. They've been so dumbed down here in the United States. And I talk to people all over the world. So I can tell you candidly here that American citizens are the most dumbed down of them all. It's the truth. Um, you, they don't even pay attention to these things. But why, why is this stuff being done? Well, it's because there's a crime in progress. Um, this is a crime in progress we're watching unfold here, and no one's batting an eye about it. Everyone thinks everything is just fine, just like they did prior to the last bubble and the bubble before that in the stock market. I'm just going to refer to the last two bubbles, the 2008 and the dot-com bubble, because most people, well, maybe not most people. I'm old enough. I lived through both of these bubbles, um, so I know what I remember what they were like. But most people just remember the last one, I guess. I don't know how old your audience is. I'm an old guy. How old am I? I'm 53. So, um, you know, I've gotten to see a few things in my lifetime already, um, but that's what's going on here. It's a crime scene. It's being covered up. But the sad thing about this crime scene is these people are above the law. These people are untouchable. And where's the proof of that? Well, I challenge one person in listening to this to tell me one executive, just one, who was held responsible for any, um, anything that they might have done wrong uh, during the 2008 meltdown. Did any executive go to jail? No. A couple of little flunkies got in a little trouble here and there, but not one executive did. These people are above the law. They'll always be above the law. And there's a reason for that too. And this is another way that the banks have us all by the you know what. The system only functions for one reason and one reason only. That is confidence that it will continue to function. That's it. It's built it's built on confidence. If we if we shatter that confidence, the system collapses overnight. So this is why you do not see bankers. You will never see an executive go to jail, be held accountable. Won't happen. And the central banks of the world um, along with their supporting banks, JP Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, all of them. Um, they're too big. They're too powerful. And um, unfortunately, I think, and, you know, look, people, people are going to say what they want, but um, you, there's not a power on this earth that can, that can stop that, that can take away what they have uh, worked for decades upon decades to achieve, uh, and not in our lifetime at least. And even when this entire thing corrects to a fair value, um, it's going to be not, once again, it's not going to be the banks 
or the central banks that are going to be held accountable at all. It's going to be the people who are blamed for it. Oh, well, it was, you know, you guys got in here and you guys didn't speculate. You lost all your cash because you got greedy. You went out and you bought two houses. You went out and borrowed money to participate in the stock market. So this is what's going to happen. It's, and, you know, and then what's going to happen? And then the bailouts come because that we're already seeing that the farmers are now being bailed out because of tariffs, $12 billion. Yeah, it's just a, it's just a fraction of a fraction, but that sets a precedence too. Um, if one company is going to get a bailout, because they're being hurt by a tariff or anything else, guess what? So are other ones. And I'll tell you who, what that includes, the banks. So here you go, people. I mean, I think I've painted a really nice picture for you. Uh, and you can go around it and look around it and see how, how concise it actually is. Uh, so I don't know what to tell you. I wish I could tell people something else. But unfortunately, this is the way it's going to unfold and is unfolding right now. It's not like we're waiting for it. This is happening now. Do you think, I mean, this has been going on for a very long time, the economy. I mean, no one thought it would be going on, you know, it was 2008. Here we are in 2018, almost 10 years. Uh, from everything that you're looking at and everything that you research, even though the Treasury is expanding their bond purchasing and things like that, can they keep this going for like another, you know, five years, 10 years? Is it really possible? <laughs> I guess anything is possible. But, but again, you did hit the nail on the head. I don't think anyone understood. And I'm going to say this just for myself because I can't speak for anybody else here. But I did not imagine that we would have QE1, QE2, Operation Twist, whatever they did after that, and what they are continuing to do now. Um, there is a lot of things going on between world central banks. And I've, I've heard rumors that world central banks are actually buying each other's debt under the table somehow and keeping it off balance sheet. Uh, I'm not even sure how that's happening or even possible, but I don't doubt that it, at all that isn't happening. So this has gone way, way, way beyond any what I believe uh, for myself. Again, I'm just going to speak for myself. Would have believed would have been sustainable uh, at this point. At this point, but who would have guessed that they would have done this? I think I believe this what I'm about to say, and uh, I don't know if I've spoken about it on your show before, but I've taken a lot of heat for it, but I want people to understand why, and I'll try to put a perspective on it. When we had the meltdown last time and the credit markets froze, that means that, that people were not, and this, this happened, this isn't speculation, this was real, people can research this on their own. The credit markets froze, that means that, that businesses couldn't transact they couldn't borrow cash just to function, big corporations. And the next step there would have been people having people locked out of their banks, not having access to cash within a very short period of time, probably two weeks. So what ended up, what probably, what, what had to happen, and this is where I've gotten in a lot of trouble with people who don't understand why it had to happen, is they, the, the, the Fed had to do something. They had to get in there and, and unfreeze the credit markets. Otherwise, again, no cash for transactions, no cash to buy food, businesses shut down, people get laid off, done, period. The end, Great Depression, over. That's the truth. That's what was happening. Not may have, that was what was happening. So the Fed had to get in there and do QE1. I, at, I said they, they, this, I believed in that at, at that moment because people needed to transact. People needed to shop. People needed to buy things just to support their own lives and get formula for the babies and whatever else. And then, then came the next phase. QE2 was when this started to get out of control. I understand what they were trying to do. They wanted to reinflate the bubbles, but that's where the that's where the, they went wrong. When they had not, when they when they unfroze the credit markets, when things started to move, yeah, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was at six thousand. It had cut its uh, it was at twelve thousand. It went it cut got cut in half. So at that point, the market should have been allowed to work. They should have stopped. The Fed should have, if they really wanted to the market to normalize. Uh, we would have. We would have normalized. Everything would have built back up and the market would have been real. I don't know what the Dow Jones Industrial Average would be today, but I can tell you maybe it would be back to 12. Uh, maybe. Uh, something like that. Uh, maybe a little less than that. I can't really tell you. But it wouldn't be anywhere where it is now. So <laughs> – 
so the, the, when they went on to that QE2, they started um, again, they said, hey, well, what can we do here to reinflate bubbles? Now, why did they have to get in here and do this? Let's understand. At that particular time, they had already bailed out banks. They, were, you know, they, they bought all the toxic assets. So they had all these toxic assets sitting on their books. People got kicked out of their homes. They had to make these toxic assets worth something. So they inflated a debt bubble, which pulled the housing back up reinflated a housing bubble and then super reinflated a stock market bubble. Um, that's the way it played out. And unfortunately they kept it going. They didn't stop. They just kept going and going and they, they're still going. Look, this is what I want people to understand. A a another basic thing that, um, and it's, it's, it's just so rigged. The whole thing, it's, it's a cycle the world central banks deliberately do this. They deliberately blow bubbles uh, and it won't stop. It's going to continue to even after this one, although I can't imagine how they're going to get out because last time they just reinflated it by inf reinflating the debt, by, by pushing a debt bubble to the extremes of extremes. And will it get bigger than it is right now? Probably. Uh, I'm sure they're going to do everything they can. And I am more than certain that a, a huge effort, is going to be put in place through the mid terms to keep the stock market higher. People are distracted. If people see that the stock market is higher, they believe everything could not be better. So when you hear President Trump say, hey, you know what? Our economy is as good as it's ever been. Well, is that really the truth or is it the stock market is as pretty much as high as it's ever been? Because we keep, keep getting uh, more and more negative uh, economic reports. I mean, the biggest negative, in my opinion, is what we found out what the Treasury is going to do. But yesterday we found out that the demand for housing just hit a two-year low. Now, there's going to be people out here. They're going to say, hey, you know, the issue is that there's not enough uh, uh, housing on the market. Well, that's just not true. There's not enough affordable housing. The average guy or the average girl on an average salary, can't afford a home anymore. They can't, On their salary, they cannot afford an average home. That's the definition of a bubble. Uh, and we're starting to see, you know, that, that kind of play out as well. But there's so much that's going on here um, that, that that's not being covered by the mainstream because all they're talking about, look, the election's over and she lost. But meanwhile, they keep trying to divide the people by keeping them, you know, pissed off about the election, pissed off about what's happening with Donald Trump and this Fugazi thing with Russia. You know, it's just they, they, they can't stop and they won't stop. It's the simple strategy that has worked forever, and that is divide and conquer. Do you know people don't realize that the number of Americans now homeless living in their vehicles has exploded uh, as a matter of fact, Zero Hedge did a nice edge, uh, article on this uh, recently. I mean, you, you could go on and on here. Um, you can they, they can tell us what they want to say. They can fist feed us whatever they want to fist feed us. It's just it's just not true. Uh, if you know where to look, um, it's just all fake. It's just terrible. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, what they're telling us and the information they're putting out there, especially the statistics with like GDP and unemployment. I mean, it really, when you look at it, it really all doesn't make any sense. And we talked about how they manipulated these numbers to make them look a lot better. And, you know, it's very easy to do. I mean, anyone that's taken statistics before it, you can make it look any way you want. It's, it's You know, look, I mean, absolutely. And things and, and that's the other thing. You'll get little truths that come out, and then they don't talk about it. I mean, let's just talk about a couple of other things here. Um, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, the Commerce Department reported that construct, construction spending, construction spending uh, pretty much fell off of a cliff. You don't hear about that. The Institute for Supply Management, uh, their index dropped uh, in July as well, uh, which is the lowest reading, I believe, uh, since like April. So look, this, we're not in a boom. This is not a boom. Um, we're being fist fed that we're in a boom, but we're not in a boom. If we were, things would not be going the way they are. It's, it's just a terrible thing. But it's the same scenario that we've seen over and over again. People get strung along. They get puppetized. They get pulled along by the strings and they allow this to happen. And then when everything turns south on them, they go, well, what happened? 
Well, weren't you paying attention? I mean, seriously. I mean, that's why it's so important for uh, shows like yours to be here and trying to get people to understand this stuff because you're not going to hear any of this. You believe that you would hear a word of what I said on like CNBC or Bloomberg? They would have gagged me and had me off that show so fast. As a matter of fact, you want to laugh? They had a, a – my God, I can't remember his name. Some uh, big wig economist on CNBC. I'm watching it the other day. And during my trading day, and uh, the, this this guy was talking to Sarah Eisen from CNBC, and um, he brought up that he believed that, and this was a quote. He said, "If the stock market is not in a bubble, it's very close to a bubble." And Sarah Eisen's mouth dropped open, her eyeballs like got as, as big as fists, and they rushed the guy off the off the show. They don't want to hear it. They don't want people to know these things. It's all about. Keeping the illusion real. Oh, there is no bubble. Oh, stocks are very fairly valued. Yes, absolutely. Keep putting your cash into the stock market. Oh, absolutely. Uh, go buy, go out and rush and buy a house. As a matter of fact, we'll take, buy a house, take out a loan on that, and buy another one too. Uh, does this sound familiar to anyone? Because it should. This is what we saw last time too, except it's much worse this time. Greg, thank you very much for being on the X22 Report Spotlight. Once again, how can people see all your work? Go to my website, traderschoice.net. Take advantage of everything I have there for you. I have so much stuff there set up and free stuff. Just take advantage of it. Greg, once again, thank you for being on the spotlight. I really appreciate it. Great to be here. Thanks. Thanks.